The first two Sundays after Pascha are directly attached, we may say, to the feast. The first Sunday after Pascha is the Murmuring Women. It's a continuation of Pascha itself. That's actually Thomas, just checking to see if you're paying attention. The first Sunday is Thomas, the second Sunday is the Murmuring Women. But today, we begin something different. The Gospel, which is Gospels which are read on these Sundays, these depict events in the life of the Savior that took place between the Old Testament Passover or Exodus and the Old Testament Pentecost. Some of you might know, not know that there was an Old Testament Pentecost, but there was, and that will be an important part of how the New Testament Pentecost plays out. In the Old Testament, this is where Moses brought the law down from the mountain. Today, we begin that journey, you may say, maybe not away from Pascha, but to learn lessons that the Lord wants us to learn, especially during this time of year. And today we read the Gospel of the Paralytic. This is a really important Gospel for us, brothers and sisters, I would submit, for multiple reasons. Much has been written about this gospel, and we will not talk about all of it here today. But I'd like to first call your attention to the fact that that man was laying there by the sheep pool for 38 years. 38 years, right? For us to wait for our immediate gratification more than 38 seconds is unbelievable. We can't even bear it. If we don't get what we want instantaneously, it's like someone is removing our teeth without anesthetic. It's just horrible. Nothing could be worse than not getting what we want when we want it. This is our American way. But I think it's something that we have to really struggle against. As Orthodox Christians, we have to learn to delay gratification. We have to understand that we need to work. As you are tired of hearing me saying, Success only comes before work in the dictionary. We must work, then we will have success. We can't just get what we want when we want it. And here this man, 38 years, humbly, not grumbling, laid by this pool, hoping that somehow he would be the first one to get into it when this, the angel miraculously descended and stirred the water. Now, this might seem a little bit like magic if you don't understand the context that this, that this is happening in. There were pools. There were, well, this particular pool was very near the temple, right? Before the sacrifice of the animals in the temple, they were washed. It's kind of a type, a prototype of baptism, right? So they washed them in the pool, then they brought them into the temple, and they use them as part of the Old Testament liturgical offering. We have a bloodless sacrifice, of course, which is Holy Communion. That's a different sermon, but I thought I would mention it because I think that the mind involuntarily goes in that direction. But here, this pool was sort of to remind us, to prepare us, and maybe not so much us, but the people of the Old Testament to accept baptism, to understand that there is two kinds of cleansing that needs to take place in life. There is the cleansing where we remove dirt, right? So that's kind of what was happening there. But there is also the sanctification that needs to take place of the sort of dirt of our soul. And this is baptism, helps us with this. But there is a second baptism, which I think it's important for us to reflect on a little bit today, especially on this day, when we see this sort of Old Testament prototype of baptism mentioned in the Gospel, and that is the second baptism of repentance. You see, brothers and sisters, we are baptized into the faith, but it doesn't take us very long, and we throw off our baptismal garment. In fact, the vast majority of us stamp all over it and try to burn it, really, kind of, I mean, uh, you know, literally, but figuratively. We sort of do not treat the beautiful soul that the Lord has given us in the way that it should be treated. And therefore, God in His great mercy, instead of punishing us for taking the gift that He gives us and wasting it, He allows us to have a second baptism, and that is repentance. That's holy confession. And this is something that we can't just pass by, and we can't just say, oh yeah, whatever, that's good, sometime when I have time I'll go to confession. No. 
What was the first thing that the Lord did when he rose from the dead? He established the mystery of repentance. Remember, the apostles were hiding in the upper room. They hadn't yet been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. So they were scared. They were really scared. They just took their teacher. Who did they think was going to be next? Right? They might have been simple fishermen, but they weren't stupid. They knew that they were going to be next on the hit list. So they were hiding. The Lord appears to them, and he says, Whosoever sins you, sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. That is completely in the dichotomy of what the Old Testament was. Back to the sheep pool. When someone would do some bad thing, they had to kind of make up for it by bringing the correct sacrifice to the temple and having that sacrifice uh, made. Whether it was a sheep or it was several doves or whatever it was, they had to do that. They had to make up kind of for the bad that they did. The Lord just completely blew that up when he rose from the dead and established repentance. He allows us, brothers and sisters, not to just make up for the bad that we have done, but to be forgiven for the bad that we have done. How does that happen? First, we have to understand that we don't understand everything. It's good for us if we don't just know the definition of humility, but also try to engage in it. That being said, we trust God that he has given us this great gift, and we should use it. But we can't use it like we would use some sort of commodity and throw it away. You see, when we come to confession, we are sincerely sorry for what we have done. As sincere as we possibly can be. And what that means, brothers and sisters, is one, we confess openly our sins. Two, we agree with the Lord that we are going to try as sincerely as possible not to re repeat our sin. You see, this is very important. We can't kind of go to confession and say, oh yeah, I did that, and I'm going to do it again. But between now and then, I'm good, so I'm going to go to communion. Completely illogical. This is not an orthodox understanding of a gift of God. Rather, this is sort of a very secular, carnal understanding of what we can get, not what we can give. Because what we are trying to give to God, brothers and sisters, is repentance, is a broken heart, is a sincere desire not to again offend Him. Back to the sheep pool. We can't leave it without seeing what happens. So the man is there for 38 years. He can't get into the water because somebody's always more spry than him. He is, this is known as the Sunday of the paralytic. Right? We see him, he doesn't look like much of a paralytic in this icon. That's because he's already been healed. But oh wait, it's the Sabbath. Now, I think it's really important for us to understand why did the Lord heal on the Sabbath? Because, brothers and sisters, he wanted to show us that on the Sabbath we are to do good, not to do nothing. Right? And we would never think of doing nothing on the Sabbath. Our problem is we probably do too much. But in the Old Testament, the people, especially the Pharisees, they would do nothing. I mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. They wouldn't get up to, if they had a light switch, they wouldn't get up to turn on a light switch or light a candle. I mean nothing. But the Lord shows by healing this paralytic and on the other times when he heals on the Sabbath, not that we are to do nothing, but that we are to do good. We are not to do our work, but God's work. And I think that's really important for us. Now, the Sabbath for us, of course, is Sunday. This is the day of the resurrection, as the choir just sang beautifully as they sang the Paschal Verses. So, let's reflect a little bit, brothers and sisters, on how we are spending our Sabbath. How do we spend the time once we leave the church? Yes, we are in the church. Good. We should be thankful for that. Thank God that he gave us the strength to come to church today, on this beautiful day, when there are many temptations in the yard, dandelions, there are many things that need to be planted, there are many things that need to be done, and yet we were able to come to church. Thank God for that. But, how will we spend the rest of the day? Not just today, but every day. Sunday. How do we do that? What do we do? And if we can put first, if we can understand that this is a day 
just one-seventh of the week, where the Lord is asking us to do His work, then I think we will spend the day well. That does not mean we ignore our families and leave and, and go do something else. Family time is a perfectly good thing to do on the Sabbath. But we should also help others if we can. We should read the scripture if we can. We should be sure to say our prayers if we can. What we should do is set this day aside as a special day. Brothers and sisters, I've only scratched the surface of what the Holy Fathers teach us about this really rich and important gospel reading. And the last thing I will say is this. The Lord finds the man in the temple, and he says to him, hey, congratulations, you're healed. No, that's not what he says. He says, don't sin anymore, or a worse thing could happen to you. Sometimes we don't get that. In fact, let's be honest, we mostly don't get that. You see, St. John Chrysostom says that Sin and sickness are usually connected. Not always. Not always. But in the great scheme of things, of course, there was no sickness before there was sin, right? If you go back to the garden. But it's good for us, I think, brothers and sisters, when we are ill, to reflect a little bit and think, could this have anything to do with the spiritual life that I'm leading? Or maybe the spiritual life I'm not leading. It is not to say that God is sending lightning bolts that he is sending plagues to, to kill us because we forgot to say our morning prayers. That's not at all what we are saying. But it's good for us to reflect. When the Lord gives us the gift of a little bit of illness, to think, what could I do better in my spiritual life? And to ask the Lord, even at the time when we are sick, to help us, that if we will recover, we will be better Christians for it. Brothers and sisters, I suggest strongly that you go home today, and that you begin the good habit of reading the scripture by reading this gospel. Fifteen verses, that's all it is. But these are fifteen verses that will be very helpful for your salvation. As we begin to move more towards Pentecost, we may say, with this particular Sunday, and this Wednesday, which is coming up, is the midpoint between the two feasts of Pascha and Pentecost. Let us decide that the great virtues that the Lord has allowed us to acquire during the Great Lent will not be spent quickly, will not be thrown away into the garbage heap of our carnal desires, but that we will keep with us, that we will save in our hearts those things that we have learned and the blessings that we have received so that we will be better Orthodox Christians going forth from this point through Pentecost and all throughout the year. May the Lord grant this to all of us. Amen. Pray for the salvation of your Washington, and defend our dissolved people, peace and good.